Walk before me, and be thou perfect. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. Author's Preface I did not write this little work with the thought of its being given to the public. It was prepared for the help of a few Christians who were desirous of loving God with the whole heart. But so many have requested copies of it because of the benefit they have derived from its perusal that I have been asked to publish it. I have left it in its natural simplicity. I do not condemn the opinions of any. On the contrary, I esteem those which are held by others and submit all that I have written to the censure of persons of experience and learning. I only ask of all that they will not be content with examining the outside, but they will penetrate the design of the writer, which is only to lead others to love God and to serve Him with greater happiness and success by enabling them to do it in a simple and easy way, fit for the little ones who are not capable of extraordinary things, but who truly desire to give themselves to God. I ask all who may read it to read without prejudice, and they will discover, under common expressions, a hidden unction which will lead them to seek for a happiness which all ought to expect to possess. I use the word facility, saying that perfection is easy, because it is easy to find God when we seek Him within ourselves. The passage may be quoted which says, Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me. Yet this need not occasion any difficulty, because the same God, who cannot contradict Himself, has said, He that seeketh, findeth. He who seeks God, and who yet is unwilling to forsake sin, will not find Him, because He is seeking Him where He cannot be found. Therefore it is added, Ye shall die in your sins. But he who sincerely desires to forsake sin, that he may draw near to God, will find him infallibly. Many people imagine religion so frightful and prayer so extraordinary that they are not willing to strive after them, never expecting to attain to them. But as the difficulty which we see in a thing causes us to despair of succeeding in it, and at the same time removes the desire to undertake it, and as, when a thing appears both desirable and easy to be obtained, we give ourselves to it with pleasure, and pursue it boldly, I have been constrained to set forth the advantage and the facility of this way. Oh, if we were persuaded of the goodness of God toward His poor creatures, and of the desire which He has to communicate Himself to them, we should not imagine so many obstacles, and despair so easily of obtaining a good which He is so infinitely desirous of imparting to us. And if he has not spared his own son, but delivered him up for us all, is there anything he can refuse us? Assuredly not. We only need a little courage and perseverance. We have so much of both for trifling temporal interests, and we have none for the one thing needful. As for those who find a difficulty in believing that it is easy to find God in this way, let them not believe all that they are told but rather let them make trial of it, that they may judge for themselves, and they will find that I say very little in comparison with that which is. Dear reader, study this little work with a simple and sincere heart, with lowliness of mind, without wishing to criticize it, and you will find it of good to you. Receive it with the same spirit as that in which it is given, which is no other than the longing that you may be led to give yourself unreservedly to God. My desire is that it may be the means of leading the simple ones and the children to their Father, who loves their humble confidence, and to whom distrust is so displeasing. Seek nothing but the love of God. Have a sincere desire for your salvation, and you will assuredly find it, following this little, unmethodical method. I do not pretend to elevate my sentiments above those of others, but I relate simply what has been my own experience, as well as that of others, and the advantage which I have found in this simple and natural manner of going to God. If this book treats of nothing else but the short and easy method of prayer, 
It is because, being written only for that, it cannot speak of other things. It is certain that, if it be read in the spirit in which it has been written, there will be found nothing in it to shock the mind. Those who will make the experience of it will be the most certain of the truth which it contains. It is to thee, O holy child Jesus, who lovest simplicity and innocence, and who findest thy delight in the children of men, that is to say, with those among men who are willing to become children, it is to thee, I say, to give worth and value to this little work, impressing it on the heart, and leading those who read it to seek thee within themselves, where thou wilt take thy rest, receiving the tokens of their love, and giving them proofs of thine. It is thy work, O divine child, O uncreated love, O silent word, to make thyself beloved, tasted, and heard. Thou art able to do it, and I even dare to say that thou wilt do it by means of this little work, which is all to thee, all of thee, and all for thee. A Short Method of Prayer Chapter 1 all are commanded to pray. Prayer the great means of salvation, and possible at all times by the most simple. Prayer is nothing else but the application of the heart to God, and the interior exercise of love. St. Paul commands us to pray without ceasing. Our Lord says, Take ye heed, watch and pray, and what I say unto you, I say unto all. All, then, are capable of prayer, and it is the duty of all to engage in it. But I do not think that all are fit for meditation, and therefore it is not that sort of prayer which God demands or desires of them. My dear friends, whoever you may be, who desire to be saved, come unto God in prayer. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich." It is easily to be obtained, far more easily than you could ever imagine. Come, all ye that are athirst, and take this water of life freely. Do not amuse yourselves by hewing out to yourselves broken cisterns that can hold no water. Come, hungry souls, who find nothing that can satisfy you, and you shall be filled. Come, poor afflicted ones, weighed down with griefs and sorrows and you shall be comforted. Come, sick ones, to the great physician, and do not fear to approach him, because you are so weak and diseased. Expose all your diseases to him, and they shall be healed. Come, children, to your father. He will receive you with open arms of love. Come, wandering and scattered sheep, to your shepherd. Come, sinners, to your saviour. Come, ignorant and foolish ones, who believe yourselves incapable of prayer. It is you who are the most fitted for it. Come all, without exception. Jesus Christ calls you all. Let those only refuse to come who have no heart. The invitation is not for them, for we must have a heart in order to love. But who is indeed without heart? O oh, come, and give that heart to God, and learn in the place of prayer how to do it. All those who long for prayer are capable of it, who have ordinary grace and the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is freely promised to all who ask it. Prayer is the key of perfection and of sovereign happiness. It is the efficacious means of getting rid of all vices and of acquiring all virtues. For the way to become perfect is to live in the presence of God. He tells us this Himself. Walk before me, and be thou perfect. Prayer alone can bring you into His presence and keep you there continually. What we need, then, is an attitude of prayer in which we can constantly abide and out of which exterior occupations cannot draw us a prayer which can be offered alike by princes, 
kings, prelates, magistrates, soldiers, children, artisans, laborers, women and the sick. This prayer is not mental, but of the heart. It is not a prayer of thought alone, because the mind of man is so limited that while it is occupied with one thing, it cannot be thinking of another. But it is the prayer of the heart, which cannot be interrupted by the occupations of the mind. Nothing can interrupt the prayer of the heart but unruly affections. And when once we have tasted of the love of God, it is impossible to find our delight in anything but Himself. Nothing is easier than to have God and to live upon Him. He is more truly in us than we are in ourselves. He is more anxious to give Himself to us than we are to possess Him. All that we want is to know the way to seek Him, which is so easy and so natural that breathing itself is not more so. O oh, you who imagine yourselves incapable of religious feeling, you may live in prayer and in God as easily and as continuously as you live by the air you breathe. Will you not, then, be inexcusable if you neglect to do it after you have learned the way? Chapter 2 First Degree of Prayer Meditation and Meditative Reading The Lord's Prayer Passage from the First Degree to the Second there are two means by which we may be led into the higher forms of prayer. One is meditation, the other is meditative reading. By meditative reading, I mean the taking of some truths, either doctrinal or practical, the latter rather than the former, and reading them in this way. Take the truth which has presented itself to you, and read two or three lines seeking to enter into the full meaning of the words, and go on no further, so long as you find satisfaction in them. Leave the place only when it becomes insipid. After that, take another passage and do the same, not reading more than half a page at once. It is not so much from the amount read that we derive profit, as from the manner of reading. Those people who get through so much do not profit from it. The bees can only draw the juice from the flowers by resting on them, not by flying round them. Much reading is more for scholastic than for spiritual science. But in order to derive profit from spiritual books, we should read them in this way, and I am sure that the manner of reading accustoms us gradually to prayer and gives us a deeper desire for it. The other way is meditation, in which we should engage at a chosen time, and not in the hour given to reading. I think the way to enter into it is this. After having brought ourselves into the presence of God by a definite act of faith, we should read something substantial, not so much to reason upon it as to fix the attention, observing that the principal exercise should be the presence of God, and that the subject should rather fix the attention than exercise reason. This faith in the presence of God within our hearts must lead us to enter within ourselves, collecting our thoughts and preventing their wandering. This is an effectual way of getting rid of distracting thoughts and of losing sight of outward things in order to draw near to God who can only be found in the secret place of our hearts, which is the sancta sanctorum in which he dwells. He has promised that if anyone keeps his commandments, he will come to him and make his abode with him. St. Augustine reproaches himself for the time he lost through not having sought God at first in this way. When, then, we are thus buried in ourselves, and deeply penetrated with the presence of God within us, when the senses are all drawn from the circumference to the centre, which, though it is not easily accomplished at first, becomes quite natural afterwards, when the soul is thus gathered up within itself, and is sweetly occupied with the truth read, not in reasoning upon it, but in feeding upon it, and exciting the will by the affection, 
rather than the understanding by consideration, the affection being thus touched, must be suffered to repose sweetly and at peace, swallowing what it has tasted. As a person who only masticated an excellent meat would not be nourished by it, although he would be sensible of its taste, unless he ceased the movement in order to swallow it, so when the affection is stirred, if we seek continually to stir it, we extinguish its fire, and thus deprive the soul of its nourishment. We must swallow by a loving repose, full of respect and confidence, what we have masticated and tasted. This method is very necessary, and would advance the soul in a short time, more than any other would do in several years. But as I said that the direct and principal exercise should be the sense of the presence of God, we must most faithfully recall the senses when they wander. This is a short and efficacious way of fighting with distractions, because those who endeavour directly to oppose them, irritate and increase them. But by losing ourselves in the thought of a present God, and suffering our thoughts to be drawn to Him, we combat them indirectly and without thinking of them, but in an effectual manner. And here let me warn beginners not to run from one truth to another, from one subject to another, but to keep themselves to one, so long as they feel a taste for it. This is the way to enter deeply into truths to taste them, and to have them impressed upon us. I say it is difficult at first thus to retire within ourselves, because of the habits which are natural to us, of being taken up with the outside. But when we are a little accustomed to it, it becomes exceedingly easy, both because we have formed the habit of it, and because God, who only desires to communicate Himself to us, sends us abundant grace, and an experimental sense of His presence, which renders it easy. Let us apply this method to the Lord's Prayer. We say, Our Father, thinking that God is within us, and will indeed be our Father. After having pronounced this word, Father, we remain a few moments in silence, waiting for the Heavenly Father to make known His will to us. Then we ask the King of glory to reign within us, abandoning ourselves to Him, that He may do it, and yielding to Him the right that He has over us. If we feel here an inclination to peace and silence, we should not continue, but remain thus so long as the condition may last, after which we proceed to the second petition. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. We then desire that God may accomplish, in us and by us, all His will. We give up to God our heart and our liberty, that He may dispose of them at His pleasure. Then, seeing that the occupation of the will should be love, we desire to love, and we ask God to give us His love. But all this is done quietly, peacefully, and so on with the rest of the prayer. At other times, we hold ourselves in the position of sheep near to the shepherd, asking of him our true food. O divine shepherd, thou feedest thy sheep with thine own hand, and thou art their food from day to day. We may also bring before him our family desires, but it must all be done with the remembrance by faith of the presence of God within us. We can form no imagination of what God is. A lively faith in His presence is sufficient, for we can conceive no image of God, though we may of Christ, regarding Him as crucified, or as a child, or in some other condition, provided that we always seek Him within ourselves. At other times, we come to Him as to a physician, bringing our maladies to Him, that He may heal them, but always without effort, with a short silence from time to time, that the silence may be mingled with the action, gradually lengthening the silence and shortening the spoken prayer, until at length 
As we yield to the operation of God, He gains the supremacy. When the presence of God is given, and the soul begins to taste of silence and repose, this experimental sense of the presence of God introduces it to the second degree of prayer. Chapter 3. Second Degree of Prayer Called here the Prayer of Simplicity The second degree has been variously termed Contemplation, the Prayer of Silence and of Repose, while others again have called it the Prayer of Simplicity, and it is of this last term that I shall make use here, being more appropriate than that of contemplation, which signifies a degree of prayer more advanced than that of which I speak. After a time, as I have said, the soul becomes sensible of a facility in recognizing the presence of God. It collects itself more easily. Prayer becomes natural and pleasant. It knows that it leads to God, and it perceives the smell of His perfumes. Then it must change its method, and observe carefully what I am about to say, without being astonished at its apparent implausibility. First of all, when you bring yourself into the presence of God by faith, remain a short time in an attitude of respectful silence. If from the beginning, in making this act of faith, you are sensible of a little taste of the presence of God, remain as you are without troubling yourself on any subject, and keep that which has been given to you, so long as it may remain. If it leaves you, excite your will by means of some tender affection, and if you then find that your former state of peace has returned, remain in it. The fire must be blown softly, and as soon as it is lighted, cease to blow it, or you will put it out. It is also necessary that you should go to God, not so much to obtain something from Him, as to please Him and to do His will. For a servant who only serves his master in proportion to the recompense he receives is unworthy of any remuneration. Go then to prayer, not only to enjoy God, but to be as He wills. This will keep you equal in times of barrenness and in times of abundance, and you will not be dismayed at the repulses of God, nor by His apparent indifference. Chapter 4 on spiritual dryness. As God's only desire is to give Himself to the loving soul who desires to seek Him, He often hides Himself in order to arouse it and compel it to seek Him with love and fidelity. But how does He reward the faithfulness of His beloved? And how are His apparent flights followed by loving caresses? The soul imagines that it is a proof of its fidelity and of its increased love that it seeks God with an effort, or that at least such seeking will soon lead to his return. But no, this is not the way in this degree. With a loving impatience, with deep humility and abasement, with an affection deep and yet restful, with a respectful silence, you must await the return of your beloved. You will thus show him that it is himself alone that you love, and his good pleasure, and not the pleasure that you find in loving him. Therefore it is said, Make not haste in time of trouble. Cleave unto him, and depart not away, that thou mayest be increased at thy last end. Suffer the suspensions and the delays of the visible consolations of God. Be patient in prayer, even though you should do nothing all your life, but wait in patience, with a heart humbled, abandoned, resigned, and content for the return of your beloved. O oh, excellent prayer! How it moves the heart of God, and obliges Him to return more than anything else. Chapter 5. Abandonment to God. Its fruit and its irrevocability. In what it consists. God exhorts us to it. It is here that true abandonment and consecration to God should commence by our being deeply convinced that all which happens to us 
moment by moment, is the will of God, and therefore all that is necessary to us. This conviction will render us contented with everything, and will make us see the commonest events in God, and not in the creature. I beg of you, whoever you may be, who are desirous of giving yourselves to God, not to take yourselves back when once you are given to Him, and to remember that a thing once given away is no longer at your disposal. Abandonment is the key to the inner life. He who is thoroughly abandoned will soon be perfect. You must, then, hold firmly to your abandonment without listening to reason or to reflection. A great faith makes a great abandonment. You must trust wholly in God, against hope believing in hope. Abandonment is the casting off of all care of ourselves, to leave ourselves to be guided entirely by God. All Christians are exhorted to abandonment, for it is said to all, Take no thought for the morrow, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Abandonment, then, ought to be an utter leaving of ourselves, both outwardly and inwardly, in the hands of God, forgetting ourselves and thinking only of God. By this means the heart is kept always free and contented, Practically, it should be a continual loss of our own will in the will of God, a renunciation of all natural inclinations, however good they may appear, in order that we may be left free to choose only as God chooses. We should be indifferent to all things, whether temporal or spiritual, for the body or the soul, having the past in forgetfulness, the future to providence, and giving the present to God, contented with the present moment, which brings with it God's eternal will for us, attributing nothing which happens to us to the creature, but seeing all things in God, and regarding them as coming infallibly from His hand, with the exception only of our own sin. Leave yourselves, then, to be guided by God as He will, whether as regards the inner or the outward life. Chapter 6. Of Suffering, which must be accepted as from God, its fruits. Be content with all the suffering that God may lay upon you. If you will love Him purely, you will be as willing to follow Him to Calvary as to Tabor. He must be loved as much on Calvary as on Tabor, since it is there that He makes the greatest manifestation of His love. Do not act, then, like those people who give themselves at one time and hold themselves back at another. They give themselves to be caressed and take themselves back when they are crucified, or else they seek for consolation in the creature. You can only find consolation in the love of the cross and in complete abandonment. He who has no love for the cross has no love for God. It is impossible to love God without loving the cross, and a heart which has learned to love the cross finds sweetness, joy and pleasure, even in the bitterest things. To the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet, because it is as hungry for the cross as it is hungry for God. The cross gives God, and God gives the cross. Abandonment and the cross go together. As soon as you are sensible that something is repugnant to you, which presents itself to you in the light of suffering, abandon yourself at once to God for that very thing, and present yourself as a sacrifice to Him, and you will see that when the cross comes, it will have lost much of its weight, because you will desire it. This will not prevent your being sensible of its weight. Some people imagine that it is not suffering to feel the cross. 
The feeling of suffering is one of the principal parts of suffering itself. Jesus himself was willing to suffer in its intensity. Often the cross is borne with weakness, at other times with strength. All should be equal in the will of God. Chapter 7 On Mysteries God Gives Them Here in Reality It will be objected that, by this way, mysteries will not be made known. It is just the contrary. They are given to the soul in reality. Jesus Christ, to whom it is abandoned, and whom it follows as the way, whom it hears as the truth, and who animates it as the life, impressing himself upon it, imparts to it his own condition. To bear the conditions of Christ is something far greater than merely to consider those conditions. Paul bore the conditions of Christ on his body. I bear in my body, he says, the marks of the Lord Jesus. But he does not say that he reasoned about them. Often Christ gives in this state of abandonment views of his conditions in a striking manner. We must receive equally all the dispositions in which he may be pleased to place us, choosing for ourselves to abide near to him and to be annihilated before him, but receiving equally all that he gives us, light or darkness, facility or barrenness, strength or weakness, sweetness or bitterness, temptations or distractions, sorrow, care, uncertainty, none of these things ought to move us. There are some persons to whom God is continually revealing His mysteries. Let them be faithful to them. But when God sees fit to remove them, let them suffer them to be taken. Others are troubled because no mysteries are made known to them. This is needless, since a loving attention to God includes all particular devotion, and that which is united to God alone, by its rest in Him, is instructed in a most excellent manner in all mysteries. He who loves God, loves all that is of Him. Chapter 8. On Virtue. All virtues given with God in this degree of the prayer of the heart. This is the short and the sure way of acquiring virtue, because God, being the principle of all virtue, we possess all virtue in possessing God. More than this, I say, that all virtue which is not given inwardly is a mask of virtue, and like a garment that can be taken off and will wear out. But virtue, communicated fundamentally, is essential, true and permanent. The king's daughter is all glorious within. And there are none who practice virtue more constantly than those who acquire it in this way, though virtue is not a distinct subject of their thought. How hungry these loving ones are after suffering! They think only of what can please their beloved, and they begin to neglect themselves and to think less of themselves. The more they love God, the more they hate themselves. Oh, if all could learn this method, so easy that it is suited for all, for the most ignorant as for the most learned, how easily the whole church would be reformed. You only need to love. St. Augustine says, Love and do as you please. For when we love perfectly, we shall not desire to do anything that could be displeasing to our beloved. Chapter 9 Of Perfect Conversion Which is an effect of this method of prayer. Two of its aids, the attraction of God and the central inclination of the soul. Turn ye unto him from whom the children of Israel have deeply revolted. Conversion is nothing else but a turning from the creature to God. 
Conversion is not perfect, though it is necessary for salvation, when it is merely a turning from sin to grace. To be complete, it must be a turning from without to within. The soul, being turned in the direction of God, has a great facility for remaining converted to Him. The longer it is converted, the nearer it approaches to God and attaches itself to Him, and the nearer it approaches to God, the more it becomes necessarily drawn from the creature which is opposed to God. But this cannot be done by a violent effort of the creature. All that it can do is to remain turned in the direction of God in a perpetual adherence. God has an attracting virtue, which draws the soul more strongly towards Himself, and in attracting it, He purifies it, as we see the sun attracting a dense vapour, and gradually, without any other effort on the part of the vapour than that of letting itself be drawn, the sun, by bringing it near to Himself, refines and purifies it. There is, however, this difference, that the vapour is not drawn freely and does not follow willingly, as is the case with the soul. This manner of turning within is very simple and makes the soul advance naturally and without effort, because God is its centre. The centre has always a strong attractive power, and the larger the centre, the stronger is its attractive force. Besides this attraction of the centre, there is given to all natural objects a strong tendency to become united with their centre. As soon as anything is turned in the direction of its centre, unless it be stopped by some invincible obstacle, it rushes towards it with extreme velocity. A stone in the air is no sooner let loose and turned towards the earth than it tends to it by its own weight as its centre. It is the same with fire and water, which being no longer arrested, run incessantly towards their centre. Now I say that the soul, by the effort it has made in inward recollection, being turned towards its centre, without any other effort but simply by the weight of love, falls towards its centre, and the more it remains quiet and at rest, making no movement of its own, the more rapidly it will advance because it thus allows that attractive virtue to draw it. All the care, then, that we have is to promote this inward recollection as much as possible, not being astonished at the difficulty we may find in this exercise, which will soon be recompensed with a wonderful cooperation on the part of God, which will render it very easy. When the passions rise, a look towards God, who is present within us, easily deadens them. Any other resistance would irritate rather than appease them. Chapter 10 Higher degree of prayer, which is that of the simple presence of God, or active contemplation. The soul, faithfully exercising itself in the affection and love of its God, is astonished to find him taking complete possession of it. His presence becomes so natural that it would be impossible not to have it. It becomes habitual to the soul, which is also conscious of a great calm spreading over it. Its prayer is all silence, and God imparts to it an intrinsic love, which is the commencement of ineffable happiness. Oh, if I could describe the infinite degrees which follow! But I must stop here, since I am writing for beginners, and wait till God shall have to light what may be useful to those more advanced. I can only say that at this point it is most important that all natural operation should cease, that God may act alone. Be still and know that I am God, is his own word by David. But man is so attached to his own works that he cannot believe God is working unless he can feel, know, and distinguish his operation. 
He does not see that it is the speed of his course which prevents his seeing the extent of his advancement, and that the operation of God, becoming more abundant, absorbs that of the creature. As we see that the sun, in proportion as he rises, absorbs the light of the stars, which were easily distinguishable before he appeared. It is not the want of light, but an excess of light, which prevents our distinguishing the stars. It is the same here. Man can no longer distinguish his own operation, because the strong light absorbs all his little distinct lights, and makes them fade away entirely, because God's excess surpasses them all. So that those who accuse this degree of prayer of being a state of idleness are greatly deceived, and only speak thus from want of experience. Oh, if they would only prove it! In how short a time they would become experimentally acquainted with this matter! I say then that this failure of work does not spring from scarcity, but from abundance. Two classes of persons are silent. The one because they have nothing to say, the other because they have too much. It is thus in this degree. We are silent from excess, not from want. Water causes death to two persons in very different ways. One dies of thirst. Another is drowned. The one dies from want, the other from abundance. So here it is abundance which causes the cessation of natural operation. It is therefore important in this degree to remain as much as possible in stillness. At the commencement of this prayer, a movement of affection is necessary. But when grace begins to flow into us, we have nothing to do but to remain at rest and take all that God gives. Any other movement would prevent our profiting by this grace, which is given in order to draw us into the rest of love. The soul, in this peaceful attitude of prayer, falls into a mystic sleep, in which all its natural powers are silenced, until that which had been temporary becomes its permanent condition. You see that the soul is thus led, without effort, without study, without artifice. The heart is not a fortified place, which must be taken by cannonading and violence. It is a kingdom of peace, which is possessed by love. Gently following in his train, you will soon reach the degree of intuitive prayer. God asks nothing extraordinary and difficult. On the contrary, he is most pleased with childlike simplicity. The grandest part of religion is the most simple. It is the same with natural things. Do you wish to get to the sea? Embark upon a river, and insensibly, and without effort, you will be taken to it. Do you wish to get to God? Take His way, so quiet, so easy, and in a little while you will be taken to Him in a manner that will surprise you. Oh, if only you would try it! How soon you would see that I am telling you only too little! and that the experience would far surpass any description that could be given. What do you fear? Why do you not throw yourself at once into the arms of love, who only stretch them out upon the cross in order to take you in? What risk can there be in trusting God and abandoning yourself to Him? Oh, He will not deceive you, unless it be by giving you far more than you ever expected, while those who expect everything from themselves may well take to themselves the reproach which God utters by the mouth of Isaiah. Thou art wearied in the greatness of thy way, yet saidst thou not, there is no hope. Chapter 11 Of Rest in the Presence of God Its Fruits Inward Silence God commands it. Outward silence. The soul, 
Being brought to this place needs no other preparation than that of repose, for the presence of God during the day, which is the great result of prayer, or rather prayer itself, begins to be intuitive and almost continual. The soul is conscious of a deep inward happiness, and feels that God is in it more truly than it is in itself. It has only one thing to do in order to find God, which is to retire within itself. As soon as the eyes are closed, it finds itself in prayer. It is astonished at this infinite happiness. There is carried on within it a conversation which outward things cannot interrupt. It might be said of this method of prayer, as was said of wisdom, all good things together come to me with her. For virtue flows naturally into the soul, and is practised so easily that it seems to be quite natural to it. It has within it a germ of life and fruitfulness, which gives it a facility for all good and an insensibility to all evil. Let it then remain faithful, and seek no other frame of mind than that of simple rest. It has only to suffer itself to be filled with this divine effusion. The Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. The reason why inward silence is so necessary is that Christ, being the eternal and essential Word, in order that He may be received into the soul, there must be a disposition corresponding with what He is. Now it is certain that in order to receive words we must listen. Hearing is the sense given to enable us to receive the words which are communicated to us. Hearing is rather a passive than an active sense, receiving and not communicating. Christ being the word which is to be communicated, the soul must be attentive to this word which speaks within it. This is why we are so often exhorted to listen to God and to be attentive to His voice. Many passages might be quoted. I will be content to mention a few. Hearken unto me, O my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation. Hearken unto me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel. Hearken, O daughter, and consider, and incline thine ear, Forget also thine own people and thy father's house, so shall the king greatly desire thy beauty. We must listen to God and be attentive to him, forgetting ourselves and all self-interest. These two actions, or rather passions, for this condition is essentially a passive one, arouse in God a desire towards the beauty he has himself communicated. Outward silence is extremely necessary for the cultivation of inward silence, and it is impossible to acquire inward silence without having a love for silence and solitude. God tells us by the mouth of his prophet, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak to her. To be inwardly occupied with God and outwardly occupied with countless trifles. This is impossible. It will be a small matter to pray, and to retire within ourselves for half an hour or an hour, if we do not retain the unction and the spirit of prayer during the day. Chapter 12 Self-Examination and Confession Self-examination should always precede confession. Those who arrive at this degree should expose themselves to God, who will not fail to enlighten them and to make known to them the nature of their faults. This examination must be conducted in peace and tranquility, expecting more from God than from our own research, the knowledge of our sins. When we examine ourselves with an effort we easily make mistakes. 
we call evil good and good evil, and self-esteem easily deceives us. But when we remain exposed to the searching gaze of God, that divine sun brings to light even the smallest atoms. We must then, for self-examination, abandon ourselves utterly to God. When we are in this degree of prayer, God is not slow to reveal to us all the faults we commit. We have no sooner sinned than we feel a burning reproach. It is God Himself who conducts an examination which nothing escapes, and we have only to turn towards God and suffer the pain and the correction which He gives. As this examination by God is continual, we can no longer examine ourselves. And if we are faithful to our abandonment to God, we shall soon be better examined by the divine light than we could be by all our own efforts. Experience will make this known. One thing which often causes astonishment to the soul is that when it is conscious of a sin and comes to confess it to God, instead of feeling regret or contrition, such as it formerly felt, a sweet and gentle love takes possession of it. Not having experienced this before, it supposes that it ought to draw itself out of this condition, to make a definite act of contrition. But it does not see that by doing this, it would lose true contrition, which is this, intuitive love, infinitely greater than anything it could create for itself. It is a higher action, which includes the others with greater perfection, though these are not possessed distinctly. We should not seek to do anything for ourselves when God acts more excellently in us and for us. It is hating sin as God hates it, to hate it in this way. This love, which is the operation of God in the soul, is the purest of all love. All we have to do, then, is to remain as we are. Another remarkable thing is that we often forget our faults and find it difficult to remember them. But this must not trouble us for two reasons. The first, that this very forgetfulness is a proof that the sin has been atoned for and it is better to forget all that concerns ourselves, that we may remember God alone. The second reason is that God does not fail, whenever confession is needful, to show to the soul its greatest faults, for then it is He Himself who examines it. Chapter 13 On Reading Vocal Prayer Requests the proper manner of reading in this degree is, as soon as we feel attracted to meditation, to cease reading and remain at rest. The soul is no sooner called to inward silence than it should cease to utter vocal prayers, saying but little at any time, and when it does say them, if it finds any difficulty or feels itself drawn to silence, it should remain silent and make no effort to pray, leaving itself to the guidance of the Spirit of God. The soul will find that it cannot, as formerly, present definite requests to God. This need not surprise it, for it is now that the Spirit maketh intercession for the saints, according to the will of God. The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us, with groanings which cannot be uttered. We must second the designs of God, which are to strip the soul of its own works, to substitute His in their place. Let Him work then, and bind yourself to nothing of your own. However good it may appear to you, it cannot be so if it comes in the way of God's will for you. The will of God is preferable to all other good. Seek not your own interests, but live by abandonment and by faith.
It is here that faith begins to operate wonderfully in the soul. Chapter 14 The faults committed in this degree Distractions, temptations The course to be pursued respecting them As soon as we fall into fault or have wandered we must turn again within ourselves because this fault having turned us from God we should as soon as possible turn towards Him and suffer the penitence which He Himself will give. It is of great importance that we should not be anxious about these faults, because the anxiety only springs from a secret pride and a love of our own excellence. We are troubled at feeling what we are. If we become discouraged, we shall grow weaker yet, and reflection upon our faults produces a vexation which is worse than the sin itself. A truly humble soul does not marvel at its weakness, and the more it perceives its wretchedness, the more it abandons itself to God and seeks to remain near to Him, knowing how deeply it needs His help. God's own word to us is, I will instruct thee, and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. In distractions or temptations, instead of combating them directly, which would only serve to augment them and to wean us from God, with whom alone we ought to be occupied, we should simply turn away from them and draw nearer to God, as a little child, seeing a fierce animal approaching it, would not stay to fight it, nor even to look at it, but would run for shelter to its mother's arms, where it would be safe. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. If we adopt any other course of action, if we attempt to attack our enemies in our weakness, we shall be wounded even if we are not entirely defeated, but remaining in the simple presence of God, we find ourselves immediately fortified. This is what David did. He says, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. It is also said by Moses, The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Chapter 15 Prayer and Sacrifice Explained by the Similitude of a Perfume Our Annihilation in this Sacrifice Solidity and Fruitfulness of this Prayer as Set Forth in the Gospel Prayer ought to be both petition and sacrifice. Prayer, according to the testimony of St. John, is an incense whose perfume rises to God. Therefore it is said in the Revelation that an angel held a censer which contained the incense of the prayers of the saints. Prayer is an outpouring of the heart in the presence of God. I have poured out my soul before the Lord, said the mother of Samuel. Thus the prayers of the Magi at the feet of the infant Jesus in the stable of Bethlehem were signified by the incense which they offered. Prayer is the heat of love which melts and dissolves the soul and carries it to God. In proportion as it melts, it gives out its odour, and this odour comes from the love which burns it. This is what the bride meant when she said, While the king sitteth at his table, my spikenard sendeth forth the smell thereof. The table is the heart. When God is there, and we are kept near to him, in his presence, this presence of God melts and dissolves the hardness of our hearts, and as they melt, they give forth their perfume. Therefore the bridegroom, 
seeing his bride thus melted by the speech of her beloved, says, Who is this that cometh out of the wilderness, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense? Thus the soul rises up towards its God, but in order to this, it must suffer itself to be destroyed and annihilated by the force of love. This is a state of sacrifice, essential to the Christian religion, by which the soul suffers itself to be destroyed and annihilated, to render homage to the sovereignty of God. As it is written, The power of the Lord is great, and He is honoured of the lowly. And the destruction of our own being confesses the sovereign being of God. We must cease to be, so that the Spirit of the Word may be in us. In order that He may come to us, we must yield our life to Him, and die to self, that He may live in us, and that we, being dead, our life may be hidden with Christ in God. Come unto me, says God, all ye that be desirous of me, and fill yourselves with my fruits. But how can we be filled with God? Only by being emptied of self, and going out of ourselves, in order to be lost in Him. Now, this can never be brought about, except by our becoming nothing. Nothingness is true prayer, which renders to God honour and glory and power for ever and ever. This prayer is the prayer of truth. It is worshipping the Father in spirit and in truth. In spirit, because we are by it drawn out of our human and carnal action, to enter into the purity of the Spirit, who prays in us, and in truth, because the soul is led into the truth of the all of God, and the nothing of the creature. There are but these two truths, the all and the nothing, all the rest is untruth. We can only honour the all of God by our nothingness, and we have no sooner become nothing than God, who will not suffer us to be empty, fills us with himself. Oh, if all knew the blessings which come to the soul by this prayer, they would be satisfied with no others. It is the pearl of great price, it is the hidden treasure. He who finds it gladly sells all that he has to buy it. It is the well of living water which springs up into everlasting life. It is the practice of the pure maxims of the gospel. Does not Christ himself tell us that the kingdom of God is within us? This kingdom is set up in two ways. The first is when God is so thoroughly master of us that nothing resists him. Then our heart is truly his kingdom. The other way is that by possessing God, who is the sovereign Lord, we possess the kingdom of God, which is the height of felicity and the end for which we were created. As it has been said, to serve God is to reign. The end for which we were created is to enjoy God in this life, and men do not believe it.